down the hammer and pick up the pencil. You're about to listen to the Savvy Radio Show. Learn from real life real estate investors, experience revealed with the Savvy Landlord as your host. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Yep, boys and girls. It's time to learn creative techniques to go to the next level. I mean, the most awesome way to get a property. Did I say free? Not yet, because you can free with subject two. I noticed I'm here with my superstar friend forever, Thomas Morgan from Chattanooga, Tennessee. Hello. Hey, what's going on, Steve? And I've noticed, I actually kind of Googled this up, and I haven't really seen a lot of people talk about subject two, meaning like courses, ton of blogs, or a website dedicated to subject two, but subject two has been sometimes known as a taboo um, way of taking property, uh, title, ownership, or whatever you want to call it. But I know that my mentor was picking these off, I'm assuming when the collapse happened, and people were just walking away from properties because of subprime loans and, you know, turning it into a gold mine. So this episode today is kind of like the, the basics or introduction to subject two, which is what you're good at. So let's just talk about you and um, how many subject twos have you done? I've done probably 20 or 30 of them over time. Uh, they're good for short-term rehab money to me. Like, why would I go pay a private lender 5, 10, 15 percent? On their money when I could take over the existing debt at four, five, six percent, sometimes even seven. Um, well, is okay. So, subject to basically is that someone has a mortgage in their name and they need to move or they can't afford it or they have a distress situation, meaning uh, a divorce or they're transferred. Are those hard to find in general or are they just everywhere and anywhere? Like, how do you find them? And did I miss something of describing what a subject to is? Basically, what subject to is, you're buying the property subject to the existing loan. You're buying it with a special warranty deed, warranting that no one else has a claim to it except that current mortgage holder. Uh, it's not the ideal way to buy. It's not the ideal way to sell just because you have a a lien in someone else's name that the bank's going to want information to resolve it, such as social security numbers, authorizations to release, insurance benefits. There's a lot of different moving parts in them as far as a real estate transaction. <clears throat> one, one way I do it is it, I buy into a land trust. I, I give title to if I'm buying 123 Main Street, yeah, I name it the 123 Main Street Land Trust. Um, I'll be the trustee. I'll have them deed it, or I'll have them deed it into the land trust as, with the seller's name as the beneficia beneficiary. Immediately after closing, I'm transferring the beneficial interest to my holding company, per se. So I'm on title, but I have a document stating that the the trust was for the benefit of the seller at, at one point in time. So basically, the the land trust grants you authority to control the property. Yes, it's a way of bypassing the due on sale clause because it's for trust for the benefit of the seller at one point. Now, a dual on sale clause is in a traditional mortgage since the 1980s that when people were just walking away from loans that they the banks got clever and put this clause in there that if the property ever changed title, that they can call the loan due. But that's kind of rare because no bank wants to repo a property, right? Well, it's not even the fact that they were people weren't just walking away from the house in the eighties. They were selling their house and the loans were assumable back then. Like you could just take over the debt that was in place. I mean, from a hard money lender perspective, you, I mean, you own a lot of 
private money and hard money? Would you want your note to be assumable? You don't have the credit background check on the person. True. You don't have any information. Who, who do you mail the docs to? Who do you, who's really in control? I mean, interest rates started shooting 15, 18% in the late 80s. So people were just taking over a debt at 6%. And the banks were losing money. So that's when they went to Congress and said, we need to get put this due on sale clause. Basically, if you sell the property, you have to pay us off, which is fair for the banks. Um, there was two senators, Senator Garn and Senator St. Germain, organized the Garn St. Germain Act, which says you can, if the if you did it into a trust for your family planning purposes or you're not truly transferring, you're changing the title. You're not truly transferring the title. So they put that into effect that if it gets to a trust for estate planning purposes, you, it's a loophole to the do on sale. Okay. So again, the trust kind of gives you the authority to manage this asset for these people, but they're still bound to the mortgage because the mortgage is in their name. Yeah, the they signed all the documents guaranteeing it. The trust kind of just puts a layer over the mortgage saying that this new trust is kind of running this operation, AKA trust property and all things go through the trust. And so that's a, a tool that people use for protection, asset protection, um, and just another layer. And then now you have control of it and now you're the, you're the recipient out of a, a beneficially interest and now you can control the property. Now, is, is there parameters, like give us an example of a deal that, that you did, and I can give you an example of several deals that I've done, but give us a, like a kind of a basic one that was a pretty decent deal. I mean, nothing, nothing elaborate, just c kind of going through the motions, like walk through the motions, like how you met the person, uh, how'd you make your, how'd you present your offer, and let's go through that process. Okay, very simple one. Uh, it was 816 Northbrook Drive. Sodded Daisy. Uh, guy bought the house, ends up going through a divorce, dates the girl next door. Um, girl next door moves into him. She goes kind of crazy. Starts. He ends up moving out of his own house. She's living in it. Trashed the place. Mostly cosmetic damages. But the guy had, he moved out into another apartment. Now he's got a property he can't sell because he's got his ex-wife in there now or ex-baby mama in there he's having to pay two mortgages on his, a new place and the old place it was about to bankrupt him he was only a month behind but there wasn't a huge amount of equity but he couldn't even go next door or go to his house to repair it he finally got her evicted and he was just willing to walk away he didn't want any money out of the sale. He just wanted to get out. So we were able to, I was able to get a private lender. Um, I gave him a collateral assignment of beneficial interest. I borrowed $15,000 for the rehab money from him. Wow. We took over the property. Wait a minute. Hold on. So this guy gave you the property by subject to, and yes. then he turned around. So basically he paid you to take his problem away from him. No, he just walked away from the property, but it still needed fifteen, about 12, 15 repairs. So did you pay him back? He gave you like a loan? Uh, I brought a, brought a private money lender on. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I thought, I, I'm, I thought you got that 15 G's from the actual seller. <laughs> sorry. I actually I like, paid a private lender 20% on his money because it was small money. Okay. So. It was a second mortgage position. So it was a little bit higher risk, but he was protected because I gave him a collateral assignment of beneficial interest on um, your on that trust on the trust that we created from the initial. So you did, was that so if I defaulted? I would just de the, he would be in control of the trust. Okay, so basically it was a one page document that you nestled in the trust, stating that this if this happens, this guy receives the trust. Correct. And if I default, it goes to my private lender. Okay. How I wrote that. Okay. It, but well, that's kind of like even more risky. So like basically you're assigning a subject to, to a private lender to get 15,000. I'm, I'm assigning it if I default. Yeah. On. But still, I mean, so, just let you know, just trying to get technical login there, buddy. Okay. December, uh, 
went in, redid the property, repainted it, painted the kitchen cabinets, new carpet, just mostly cosmetic stuff, cleaned it up and resold it by, it was sold by March. Paid my private lender, he got back 18,000. We netted a little over 28,000 on the rehab in three months. And so the, the, the ultimate benefit is that you didn't have to go get a loan to buy the original asset like to, for acquisition purposes. So, you know, my old mentor from 20 years ago is like, I only buy houses to live in that it's free. I don't have to go get a loan. I don't have to, you know, give a financial statement. I'm just signing a few documents. I can do a table closing or at a title company and you acquired this asset. How much was this asset worth? Uh, we sold it for about 164. So, uh, and so at the time it was worth like 120, I guess, a hundred thousand. We picked it up for 99 subject to the existing loan. So, so the guy had a hundred thousand dollars due on his mortgage that he's been paying for how long? Uh, he'd only been in it for two or three years. Okay. So he got a pretty good deal at the time. You had force appreciation in your market. You acquired the asset with no money down. You then you did another no money down repair, uh, rehab loan, which yes. he was low money and it was a high return for him. And he knew you. Plus he also had the ability to get out. I mean, if you defaulted, he had that hundred and something thousand dollar asset. You turn around, listed the property for 160,000, paid the fees, paid all those people back and pocketed about 30 G's. Yes. Okay. And that's just one tool you could use a subject to for. I mean, I keep, I have a couple of rental properties that are subject twos. I don't necessarily recommend it long term because you get, you get issues with the insurance. Uh, right. Naming yourself additional insured, but most insurance policies, you're worth, you're the guy that's insured. Problem is you have a mortgage that has to be insured. So the first people I name is really the original sellers. So if it's John Smith that sold me the property, the insurance policies in the name of John Smith, my company's basically it names as the second mortgage. All right. Uh, so say the house burns down, the first people it gets paid off is Sun Trust or whoever the initial mortgage holder was, anything over that would come to me. Now, I, I have, when I've done my subject twos, I usually get blowback from the insurance company, even though I may have a power of attorney document or they, they're like, they're really kind of scrutinized. Who are you? You know, it's kind of a slow play. Have you ever, uh, I mean, maybe not for you, but for me, I, you know, it's just kind of complicated, but I'm not a big detail guy. And it's not complicated. I guess it's just strenuous of developing relationship with that ass with the asset manager or the bank per se. Have you ever considered doing like a second insurance on it? On top of that, like I have a property that the escrow is so low because they have a harp loan on this property. I took it over subject to, and I'm nervous about something happening. So I just add that into my rental fleet. Have you ever doubled up on insurance? You double up on insurance policies. I mean, to me, if it's already escrowed and your payments, just make sure it's a landlord policy, not a homeowner policy on there. That changes the amounts. Right. Uh, so, I mean, I've taken over subject to governmental loans. I've taken over uh, high predatory lenders. Have you had any difficulties with any specific type, like lower level uh, note? note buyers, you know, like subprime stuff, or has it always been like class A banks that you've been dealing with? I've had some lower level stuff that local banks are a little bit more of a challenge per se. Cause like I had one, we had to buy, it, it was like a thousand bucks behind on his payments and it needed a little bit of work. Um, we rented it out and the seller kept going back harassing my tenants and it got to the point, I was like, I will deed this back to you the exact same way. I got it. So we huh. gave it to him with tenant, gave it, just quick claimed it back to him out of the trust uh, a month <laughs> behind and yeah, <laughs> made sure we got our money back and here you go. You, and move down the road. Yeah. You know, when you liability and risk to me, I didn't have, I didn't want to be cash flowing on it and then 
have a bank take it back with tenants in place. I'm like, if you, you want to claim it's your house, here you go, no problem. And I had another issue one time, this is years ago, but the 911 had changed the address on, on the house. And the mortgage company kept mailing to the old 911 address, and it was an owner occupied only loan. What do you, oh, like the number of the house was 911 or? No, like our 911 system in Chattanooga, they can't process uh, unit A, unit B. So now you get 115. Uh, oh, I see. They added, a di they added a digit or something. And they'll change the numbering the whole street. Okay. To make that work. So the mortgage kept, all the docs kept getting sent back. So they finally sent an inspector out there, knocked on the door and we had a tenant in place. And they're like, I don't know who that guy is. And so they triggered the note to call due. And so you've had a full blown subject to call due. Yeah. So have I, I've actually fought it. So how'd you deal with that one? Uh, that one, we didn't have a lot of money tied up into it. So it was purely cash flow. And unfortunately the, the loan required that it was owner occupant. The owner had moved to Arizona. So we tried to work it out. There wasn't enough equity for me to want to refinance it or pull a private lender on board. So it, we had to let it go, let their no go. Yeah. So, okay. Because there's no risk involved. That's the yeah. great thing about subject two. you. It's just your time and paperwork. Mm -hmm. And do you normally, um, table close these no i do them all with the title company I okay have the title company draw up a warranty deed into the trust or a special warranty deed into the trust and i bring down all my documents my authorization to release the assignment of insurance policies and uh, so that's amazing no and no 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 escrow no agent just kicks that back because it's not a common thing that happens all the time or subject to or is this subject to is popular there um, they're really not that popular here. You have to find an agent that understands what's going on. It's on HUD one settlement statement. Oh yeah. Or just, but a lot of title companies don't understand what's going on or how. So it's a confused mindset. No, they just shut down and say, no, that's illegal. You don't do, we don't do that. It's more common with commercial title. Oh, yes. Good, good point. I, I noticed that, um, subject twos are, are all over commercial. It's a common thing because people get overextended in commercial very quickly because the numbers are more zeros and they, they live in usually bigger buildings. Usually the owners are not in that state and they just don't want to deal with it anymore. And then they'll just sell it on terms or either do like a contract for deed per se. But mainly I've seen a ton of contract for deeds in the commercial arena. Yeah, you just have to understand the debt that you're truly taking over. I mean, is there a balloon? Does it mature? Own and just? Does it? Is it? I mean, what's what's the truly the terms of the debt? Is it a five year arm? Is it a thirty year fixed? Is it? All right, let's go into what other advantages of of a subject to. So, people, you in your case, I, you know, I. I look for subject twos and, and just give you guys some perspective that it's, they're skinny. They're not solid deals. So let's just do some fake numbers. It's a hundred thousand. The house is worth ARV a hundred thousand. And these people usually owe 90 or 95 and, or sometimes 80, but usually it's around the nine, 10% mark. They don't have enough room to hire a realtor because a realtor takes 6% plus the make ready and getting it done and they're disgruntled and they can't usually not, not all disgruntled. Sometimes it's just like they just don't have the time or the resources because they're moving on to another thing. And so I look at those where I went wrong in the past is like, like I've given people a thousand dollars to help them and then come back later. The sewer line was bad and I'm, I'm stuck yeah, with this thing. Situation. I mean, I try not to believe everything the seller tells me. But if it's a like a subject to situation, first thing I ask, okay, I need a copy of the mortgage too. Yes. I want to see what's the terms of the debt? How far behind are you really? And if I got to come to the table with thirty five hundred, and there's not really any equity, if I'm giving a seller cash, I'm buying equity. There better be a substantial amount at the discount. 
for but do me you, to want to do it. Because yeah. that, that's money I'm putting at risk. I have a note that's not truly mine unless I have the ability to pull a refi and get it into my own name or a private lender onto the board. What's my security? Why would I give you $5,000 for you to move if there's no... So you have an up uh, you have an upfront cost of your title company because I I mean you can yeah, do this with a title cost at a minimum. How much and is it? A thousand. Depends on what the transfer tax is. Oh, there's a tra oh yeah the the D tax is what it's called in Oklahoma I guess. And then your typical closing fees, and then if they are yeah. behind, do you take subject twos with a behind payment and get them caught up? Or do you take them current? Like, what's your what's your take on that? I'd much rather have them current, but I will take them behind. I don't. I'm not going to make that back payment until I have security of the deal. Like, I'll make your free back payments the day after close or the day of closing. Oh, okay, so you don't even have escrow. You don't have your title company send those payments in because you don't want them to know something happened. So that's a little trick right there. You don't want to. Hey, title company, mail these three months behind. I mean, usually I would call the mortgager mortgage and find out what's the status of the loan. And then I ask how long or how much do I, how long do I have to rectify this? And when I do, what's my fees? I've ran into where, yeah, they owe three payments and you're thinking their payments a thousand dollars a month, but yeah. then you got fees and then you have a reinstate fee that usually they charge to a junk fee. Um, and I get it to you call. You can typically get some of that stuff waived. They just want the loan current. So how far, how far back have you took a subject to that was behind eight months, eight months, 10, 10 months. And you basically, you, you've sent them power of attorney. So you can, and you had dialect with the bank. How was that? And what communicate? What would you learn in that process? Uh, it's actually pretty easy. Most of the time, it depends on the bank. Like, if they want you to fax in the document five or ten times, <laughs> sometimes it's easier just to say, "Hey, my name's John Smith. My social blah blah,", blah and they just treat it like a call center and give you any answers. But if you go in there and say, "Hi, my name's Thomas Morgan. I'm calling on behalf of John Smith," uh, their instant reaction says, "You're not." Who are you? We yeah, you know how. Yeah. And it's documented, it takes 48 hours, faxes to this number, and it drags it out. So you call up basically pretending to be that actual individual. Yeah, I'm just like, hey, my name is blah, blah, blah. Right. And then they, if they ask for some details, you give them the details that you have already that's already been pre signed to you from the seller, basically a power of attorney with the details that you need to access that account, to speed up the process because. Time is the essence. You want to get it done. They want to get out as soon as possible. What's the longest subject to that you have going? Uh, nine years right now. Wow. And you're not worried about anything? No. So what's the pitfalls of a subject to? When I said worry, some people are like, ooh, what's that mean? Well, Here's some things like one, the house could burn down and where does the insurance check go to? It's always made out to the people that are on the mortgage. Which well, I make sure the mortgage, all the paperwork stuff. For one of the first things I do when I get a subject to is I redirect the, all the mail to go to my office instead right. of the property. So that's where they're going to mail the check if there's an issue or a problem. They're going to send the statements to me. Um, I use a system called PubDoc, which allows me to organize and download statements and make it all organized. It's simple for me. But with PubDoc, I just go in and set up their online mortgage statement. So it downloads and automatically has everything for me. Uh, so you I also can change keep the that organized. Number. Yeah, change the phone numbers to you. I want to know everything that's going on. I don't want to have to hear it from the seller if the bank hasn't cashed my check or I want to hear it direct from the bank. Or, or your mortgage is sold. Have you have you had a subject to with a mortgage was sold? Uh, yeah, they'll change servicers pretty regularly. Right. Uh, especially most servicers, like most times, change a mortgage is from the note going bad. It's a lower quality of an asset to the bank, 
So they so dump it. Want- yeah, interesting. They dump it. Okay. Um, so you got to have your paperwork in order. I guess we'll cover that in another episode. And so the, the, the advantage of subject two is that you're acquiring an asset basically for free. It's in a distressed situation. You're acquiring it. You don't have to apply for a loan. You don't have to be approved. You just have a mortgage. And then how do you walk people through that scenario? Like they're, they're apprehensive. Like, they, like they're a seller. They know they need to sell. They try to talk to a realtor. The realtor's like, no way, I can't help you. The great thing is I've had a couple of realtors refer me, but, and then I've it just never materialized. How do you calm or how do you, what, what's your presentation that you say to the seller on how you can help them? Typically, they owe more than what I'm willing to pay cash is what it comes down to. So you do make a cash offer to them? So you present? Yeah. Well, typically, if they're contacting me, I'm looking, it's motivated people. Right. Um, contact me, they're off bandit signs, my websites. I, mean, I do direct mail pre foreclosures pretty regularly because I know it's a subject to source. Um, typically, if they owe about what the house is worth, they already know this. Like, or if it needs minimum repairs, I'm like, uh, basically, it's not the ideal way to sell. It's not the ideal way for me to buy. I've done it in the past where I've been able to take over the existing debt for somebody in, in situations like yours. Um, is that something you'd like to discuss? Right. And so most people think- will agree and say yes. And they want to hear more. So, well, see, I don't, I don't, I don't say take over their debt. I say I'll, I'll take over. I'll make your payments for you. Well, no, I don't say that either because then they think that they still own the home. I, yeah, I over the debt that's in place. I'm not saying I'm assuming the loan. Yes, you can't say assume. Okay. Well, that's cool. I got, I will jump off right here and we'll we'll make this anticipation. So yeah. we'll go into next time of what to look for or the pitfalls. I guess how's that? All right, perfect. All right, man. Thanks for your time. Appreciate you. What is the savvy boot camp? Are you struggling to get to the next level as a business owner, as an investor? Do you want to multiply your income? Sign up for the Savvy Bootcamp, a strategic and supercharged one night and one day event designed to shortcut your learning process and propel you forward. Just value, no upsells, and an intimate setting to build relationships with like-minded investors. We will be covering how personality profiling can make you a millionaire, outsourcing and the nitty gritty of maximizing your property management, scaling your business through systems and automation, technology hacks you should be using every day, and how to raise private money. Go to www.savvybootcamp.com now to register or to find out more. Thanks for listening to the Savvy Radio Show. Glide online and listen to our other motivating episodes at SavvyRadioShow.com. Connect on Twitter at LandlordBook and always be buying assets.